welcome, welcome to another episode of Science Cafe. Uh, we're glad that everybody can make it out tonight. This is a big crowd. We're going to welcome back our very first Science Cafe speaker. Welcome, Angela, and we're Thank you. happy to have you. Okay, let's, oh, that's quite loud. Okay, so I'm actually going to start by asking you all a question, and we'll see where we go from there. So um, I'm going to be talking about the Rosetta mission, which is uh, basically a robot that is currently chasing a comet. But to get why this is important, I need to talk about comets. And so my question for you guys is, what is a comet? What is a comet? Somebody must have an answer for me. A dirty space ball? Anybody else? A burning dirty space ball. Anyone else? Ice. Ice and dust? Well, we've got lots of different... Okay, so... Ice and rocks and iron. Anybody else? Okay. I think it's usually like orbiting the Earth in an elliptical orbit. Is that correct? Somebody said, right well, here. oh, there we go. So it is. An elliptical orbit around, not Earth, well, around the sun. Thank you. Okay, no, yes. That, that's it is. It Earth, is ju just like the planets, it is orbiting the sun. Okay? So we've got this big chunk of dirty ice that is orbiting the sun. But whereas the planets are going around in more or less circular orbits, they have these really elliptical orbits, which means that at one of the end of the orbit, they're really, really close to the sun, and at the other end, they're out past Pluto. Okay, but how many of you have ever seen a comet? A few of you. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is they're not the same as shooting stars. People expect to be able to see them moving across the sky but they're far enough from us that actually over a given night, they're just gonna look like they're in one spot. They look like a shooting star, but they're in one spot. Now, um, there are a lot of comets. A lot of them go around. Some of them are more famous than others. Um, Halley's Comet is probably the most famous, and Halley's Comet was pretty much the first one that we sent uh, anything like a probe to. So we've known about comets forever, right? It's not something that we discovered. Just like the planets, they come past and you don't need a telescope to see them. And so they're things that we've always known about. They're things that appear in mythology. They're things, there's one on the Bayer Tapestry that records the Norman conquest of Britain. Um, they're things that have always been known. But we still don't know that much about them, okay? So in, there's some things that we can do from a distance. You know, We can look at things and deduce what they're made of by using certain techniques. But we still don't get that much information. So we start with Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet was last around in 1986. And we sent a probe to this comet. And that was the first time we'd had the technology to go and visit a comet. But we didn't land on it. We sent this thing up to it, and it kind of you know, took some pictures, more or less. And since then, we've sent up a bunch of, of uh, comets to try and uh, 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 missions to try and look at comets. Uh, about a dozen o over the last three decades have been launched to try and look and find out what comets are made of. Why do we care? Why do we care what comets are made of? Why do you care what comets are made of? So we can get more uh, stuff that we need from them. So we can mine them? Yes. Okay, anyone else? It could be a source of water. Anyone else? Curiosity. Um, so, in fact, um, they are um, quite plentiful in ISIS, and there are some ideas that water on Earth was actually brought to Earth from a comet hitting. That's still not completely decided, but that's one of the ideas. Um, but if we're, you know, why we want to know is actually it's about how we understand our own origin. So if we think about how did the Earth form, how did the solar system form, how did the sun form, comets are a real integral part of that discussion. You need to understand comets to understand the full story of where we came from. 
And we really don't. We've never actually been to one. We've been to asteroids, we've been to other planets, we've been to the moon, but we haven't actually been to one. In the last decade, we've managed to um, crash a, a probe, deliberately, in fact, into a comet uh, in order to get stuff to come off it and try and figure out what it's made of. Okay? And we've also sent uh, a probe through its tail. What's the tail made of? Anybody know what the tail is that you can see? Anyone but Xander? <laughs> okay, I've got ice and steam. Okay, so there are actually two tails. And one of them is, it's, it is water vapor, it's gas. It's going to be other things as well than just water vapor. And the other one is dust. So I want you to get into your head an idea of what a comet really is. Um, actually, uh, Jason said that uh, this talk is very different from the last one. Um, I don't know how many people are repeats from that, but my last talk was about Pluto, which I classified as a really, really big comet. So, <laughs> so, so I'm not sure it's that different. <laughs> um, um, but basically, all comets come from the same part of the solar system as, um, as where Pluto is. So you've got this region out there that's like the asteroid belt. So you all know that we've got the sun and we've got eight planets. And there's an asteroid belt that divides the inner four from the outer four. And then there's another belt called the Kuiper belt. Okay? And that's where Pluto is. Pluto is considered to be a, a Kuiper belt object. And all of the objects out there are these mixtures of rock and ice. And some of them are small enough that when gravity pulls on them, they get perturbed a lot. And when that happens, they can stop doing this big circular orbit around the sun, and they can end up being um, in this more elliptical orbit that brings them in towards the sun. But they're still just this big chunk of ice and dust, rock dust, basically. Um, and as they come in towards the sun, what happens? They get hot. OK, what happens when you heat up ice? It melts, right. So what's happening is, and because space is, but it's not quite a vacuum, but it's basically, you know, there's not much, there's no atmosphere. What happens is it doesn't go through a liquid phase. It goes straight to being steam. So you've got ice and you've got the steam coming off. And it's not just water ice. You've also got uh, methane ice, ammonia ice, and this is all being evaporated. But all of that's stuck together with all these little bits of dust. So as that evaporates, the dust also gets let loose. And then it goes, gets pushed away. What's pushing it? There's no atmosphere, so there's no wind. What's pushing that material away from the comet? It is not gravity. That's right, it's the solar wind. So the sun is actually pushing material away from it all the time. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that light can produce pressure. It's called radiation pressure. And it's pushing material away. And so this material that is basically evaporating off the surface as the comet gets hotter and hotter is then being pushed away from the sun. So what we call the tail of the comet is not actually a tail at all. It's always pointing away. So as you've got it coming around the sun, as it goes back out towards the outer edges of the solar system, it will be going towards its tail, not away from it. So although we think of it as being the tail, it's in front as the comet moves away. Okay? And that's the material that's coming off. So we sent this probe called Stardust that had these collectors that went through the tail and collected material from the tail and then landed in Utah safely. And we have that collection. Okay? And so people have been studying this material. But we've never landed on a comet. And so the Rosetta mission is it's got a couple of different things. Right now, it's parked about 100 kilometers behind. Basically, it, it's tricky. It's really tricky to sneak up on a comet, OK? You basically have to get into an orbit that's like its orbit. So it takes off from Earth, and then it has to get into this orbit. And it actually uses the Earth to slingshot. You can ask me about slingshots later. Um, it, it uses the Earth and Mars to slingshot, so that it ends up in an orbit that's kind of like the orbit that the, the comet has. And it has to come up from behind. 
If it comes up from the front, the speed is too fast and there's just going to be a collision. So it has to sneak up on it from behind. And now it's basically moving in the same orbit as the comet, uh, uh, but it's parked about 100 uh, kilometers behind and it's taking pictures. And as of this week, as of uh, actually last week, as of September 4th, um, they uh, looked at the pictures that were coming back and picked a spot to land. So you can imagine, we don't know what this thing looks like this close up. We've never got this close. We've got pictures from other comets like um, Temple 1, which is the one that Deep Impact collided with. But you're going to have to find somewhere that you can actually land. So it's been, it's been scanning and trying to find a spot. So they now have five places that look like good candidates. One is now primary, and they're looking for a second as a backup. And that will be decided in the next week or so. And then in November, the spacecraft will land on the comet and do experiments on what the comet is made of. And so we will find out for the first time what is actually on the surface of a comet. We will be able to do analysis of all sorts of things in the comet. How big is the comet? Uh, the question was how big is the comet? So comets typically, this one, um, it's about 10 kilometers across. Typically, they're not very big. And this is also something that people often don't realize is that comets are pretty small. They're basically city size. They're about 5 to 15 kilometers across. And so, you know, really not that big. But when they start evaporating, they start losing all this material that's made of ice. And so they end up with what's like a really big atmosphere. So instead of looking like this tiny little rock, they now have this enormous atmosphere. And as they get towards the sun, we see reflected light. So in fact, a comet, although like in popular um, old art and old myths about comets, we have this idea that it's burning. It's actually just reflected light from the, from the sun. So the light is, is hitting both the comet, the, 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 we call it the coma, but it's this big atmosphere, and then the material that's streaming back from it. Um, and that's what we can see. So the two tails actually look different, because one of them is made of gas, and the other one is made of dust and they have different reflective properties. If you think about when you have pollution in the atmosphere and it's dust, it looks very different than a cloud. Same sort of idea. You're getting a different type of reflectance from them. So they actually look quite different. Now, I have another question for you. I said there are two tails. Why would the gas and dust be separate? I might give in and ask my child. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Xander. Okay, he said density. Um, actually, it's to do with how easy it is for it to absorb light. So I said that light can push particles, right? It has a pressure. So light is pushing on things. We actually are investigating ways to use this and have used this for um, propelling probes through, the, um, through space. You can make a solar sail. If it's got a really big surface area and not much mass, the amount of push that it receives is enough to cause it to be pushed away. We get pushed by the light in this room, but our mass is so big that we don't notice. Okay? But if you're a tiny little grain of dust or a molecule, then you don't have much mass compared to the push from the light from the sun, so you get pushed out. The difference is that if you have a dust grain, it can absorb all types of light, all colors of light. But if you're a molecule, you can't. So if you think about what neon lights are like, right? Neon lights come in certain colors. They don't come in uh, not white, usually. Um, actually, no, oh, these are trans not. We don't have any fluorescent lights in here. Usually fluorescent lights have mercury in them. And they look like they're white, but really they're not. They only have certain colors in them that mix up to make white. But that means when the light from the sun hits them, they only get pushed by those colors. They can only interact with those colors. And so what you have is that um, the, 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 the dust is pushed harder than the gases because the gas can't actually absorb most of the light that hits it. And so you get the separation of the two tails. We've got this robot that's, uh, that's sneaking up on, uh, on this comet. And when it lands, it's going to do um, a whole bunch of experiments. And there's lots of things that we want to do. And so there's ice, there's rocks. And we want to analyze all of that. And you're going to do different things depending on whether you've got ice or rocks. 
There are about eight different um, instruments that are on this robot. And when it lands, it's able to extract bits of the, of the ground, pull them into its analyzer, and be able to tell what it's made of. Um, and also, it's going to be able to tell us its isotopic composition. How many of you know what an isotope is? I figured. OK, so um, if you've ever looked closely at a periodic table, and unless you're a nerd like me, you may not have, <laughs> but um, it always gives you the mass of, of that, sorry, the mass of that particular element. And it's always a number with like loads and loads of decimal places. Actually, so for instance, you know, um, you've got carbon is 12 point something. But that's because you've got some carbons that have a mass of 12, and some that are a mass of 13, and some that are a mass of 14. Same with oxygen. Oxygen, some is a mass of 16, some is 17, some is 18. And because they're different masses, they actually behave differently according to gravity. And so depending on um, what different processes things have been uh, exposed to, you can actually have different isotopic compositions. And so we can actually learn a lot about the processes that this material has been through. Not only that, but all of these different masses of elements come from different types of stars. And so we might even be able to tell what type of stars the material came from, depending on how much it's been deformed in the solar system. And so we want to develop systems that allow us to extract those atoms and separate them into those different masses and work out how many of each one we've got. And so when I started grad school some time ago, um, well, actually, I should put this in perspective. Um, so Rosetta, it's, it's 2014. Rosetta is just sneaking up on its prey. Um, it's going to be landing in November. It was launched um, 2nd of March, 2004. Okay, So it's taken 10 years from launch to where it is now. The project I originally started as a new graduate student in 1993 was developing the oxygen isotope analysis machine for this mission, 11 years before launch and 21 years before it would actually give any data. Um, and, and in fact, my then advisor died this year before, um, before the uh, robot switched on, because it was in hibernation for most of that time. Um, so, you know, the lead time for these things is really, really long. Um, but one of the tricky things is that if you've got oxygen in water, then, you know, it, it's kind of hard to break up water and get oxygen out, but you can do it, okay? If you've got oxygen in rocks, you know, the earth is mostly oxygen. Did you know that? The most abundant element in the earth, by mass, <laughs> is oxygen. Um, and that's because all the silicates, nearly all the rocks, have oxygen in them. But getting them out of the rocks is really tricky. And the usual way that you do it in the lab is using fluorine. How many of you have heard of fluorine? Right, you all know about fluoride and how great it is for your teeth. Fluorine, on the other hand, will kill you. Um, fluorine is, very, is, is the only thing that is more reactive than oxygen on its own. It's the only thing that's going to you know, take oxygen out of a, a, a compound. The problem with that is now you've got this gas and you want to contain it so that you can um, get it to the comet and then inject it into your sample so you can get the oxygen isotopes out. And you want to do that without the possibility that there would be some sort of catastrophic leak and destroy everybody else's experiments. So that was actually my project when I started graduate school. Um, it turns out that it's pretty much impossible to do that. And so the uh, Ptolemy instrument, which is the instrument that does this stuff, is looking at carbon isotopes and hydrogen isotopes and nitrogen isotopes. But it is not looking at oxygen isotopes, which is most depressing for me. I guess they should have been nicer to me, and then I wouldn't have quit. <laughs> OK, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. What questions do you have for me about comets, about missions to comets, anything like that? It, the question was, is the robot coming back or just sending data? It is just sending data. It's not designed to come back. Um, so we, we have a good enough system to be able to uh, collect data from it for quite some time. But we'll be able to see how things change as this thing approaches and goes around the sun and comes back. So we'll, we'll actually get quite a lot of data from it. 
quick question about um, this concept of ice and rock. It seems like a lot of the pictures of comments, it looks like mostly rock, less ice. But you're describing ice and rock. So like, is the water in lakes and stuff? Or where, where's the water on these comments? OK, that's a good question. So let, let me back up and talk about Pluto just a little bit. Um, Based on, I mean, just very simple things, like we know how massive Pluto is because it's, um, it's got a moon, and that allows us to figure out the gravity. We know how dense it is because we can see how big it is. From its density alone, we think it has to be about one-third ice, two-thirds rock. But it's so cold. You're talking about something that is, you know, down at, um, oh, I'm not sure I can think in, in Fahrenheit, sorry. Um, <laughs> but it is significantly below the freezing point of water. In fact, it's below the freezing point of methane. Um, and so none of it is liquid. And so, so it's all mixed up. It's something that basically has formed out of these very cold temperatures, so it's never been warm. And it's something that then you just get this mess. So if you think about a dirty snowball, but you've got a lot of dirt in there, you're getting close. That's a good question. OK, the question was, how are they formed? Um, well, so we have to talk about the formation of the solar system, because it's an integral part of that. So um, and we're actually able to watch this now, because there are so many other star systems that are forming currently that we can see baby solar systems and things that are just, have just formed. Um, basically, you have a really enormous cloud. And it's very cold, because it doesn't have a star. And then as that collapses down, it forms a star in the center. But because it will have a little bit of spin, it doesn't need very much, just a little bit, because you know nothing is stationary in space. Um, as it condenses down, it will start to spin faster and faster. So you get that effect that you get with ice skaters. As you pull, pull the arms in, then you get uh, spinning faster. So now you've got this spinning disk. Also, it's going to be a big round thing. But if you think about something that's spinning, um, if you've ever seen how pizzas are made properly, where they throw the dough ball up in the air, that is from the centrifugal force. Basically, you have this force away from the axis of rotation, and so you get a spin, you get a, a disk, and so we end up with this disk, and then the sun is in the middle, and the planets and the asteroids and the comets all form out of that, and so it's basically formed out of whatever was in the solar system, whatever was in that big cloud, um, it forms out of that, but you have some interesting effects that happen because of temperature, so the inner solar system can only form the things can, that can exist at really high temperatures, so that dictates what Mercury is made of. And as you go further and further out, you've got more things that can exist as solids. They can be ices. And so once you get out to where the comets are, you just have this big mess of stuff. And it just, you know, basically imagine a big thing of um, ice and slush and, um, and dirt and rocks. And it's all swirling around. And when they hit each other, they will tend to stick. And eventually, you end up with these clumps. It clumps. Yes. Right. So they're all in kind of orbits that aren't quite circular, and they're all overlapping. And so they kind of hit each other, and eventually, and that's also how you end up with mostly circular orbits. So are they always getting bigger, or is it done now? So the question was, are they always getting bigger? Um, basically, you get to a point where the density isn't high enough. So just to put this in perspective, um, I'm a big fan of Star Wars. Anybody who knows me knows this. Um, but there's, there's this scene in Empire Strikes Back where Han Solo is flying his uh, Millennium Falcon through an asteroid field, right? The asteroid belt doesn't look like that. And the Kuiper belt is even sparser. The distance between these things is huge. So in the early solar system, when there's lots of stuff, they start to sweep up. But then you've used up all the material, and the collisions are unlikely. So you, you stop being able to build. There was another question back here. Hello. Um, my question is about the robot. Um, I was wondering what it kind of looks like. I know you don't have a picture, but you know, like how big it is and who made it. So um, actually, with a lot of space missions, this is an ESA mission. So this is European Space Agency. So you can go and look at who made which pieces of it. Um, it was launched from French Guiana. Um, it, it's been. Uh, it, it's got. It's not much. I mean, it's smaller than me. It's like big barrel sized. Um, and it's, um, it's basically like a big hexagonal bar barrel, more or less. Um, and that, that's pretty much all there. And it's got, it's got a little place that it can put things out that's like a little balcony. Um, actually, Rosetta itself is not the lander. The lander is, uh, is called Philae. 
um, the Rosetta is actually a probe that's, that's orbit, it's now in orbit, um, and so it's in orbit around the comet, and it's taking images of it, and then it has this lander that can detach from it that will go down, okay? But it's as small as they can make it, um, which is pretty small. Uh, so yeah, we're talking about a large barrel, basically. Say that again. Oh, it's so um, you can actually look up who made which pieces, but it's a mixture of different European countries. So the the piece that I was working on came from the Open University in Britain. There's also stuff from various different labs in Germany, France, Finland. Um, so it, it's made by different units, but it's all European. But NASA has a very there's a lot of good cooperation in terms of data sharing. So NASA has some good. Um, pages on, you can find out a lot of this stuff very easily. Yeah, um, like the second thing that you mentioned when you asked what is a comet or what can it be used for was like mining it. How realistic actually is that? Cause it's like super duper far away. Like, is that even a thing that we should be thinking about at all? Well, I, I, so that, that's a good question. Honestly, um, when it comes to mining things, you have to think about what do we mine on the Earth? We mine metals, but we mine a lot of fossil fuels. We're not going to have any of those on anywhere that doesn't have life. So you're not going to be able to extract anything that is um, like coal or oil. You also are not going to have the same sort of processes. So in places where you get, oh, diamonds. Diamonds would be another thing that come from, so you're not going to be able to get that. Things like some um, other metals, like gold, for instance, um, you have to have certain geologic processes happen for you to get good concentrations of that. So, um, honestly, it's, it's made of things that we have a pretty high abundance of, um, you know, water, um, <laughs> uh, and it's not clean enough to drink. So, it, it's not something that would really be a, a mining issue. But it might, it might be something that we could use if we were moving off the earth. Okay, that's a really good question. And that brings me to how we actually came up with some ideas. Oh, yeah, sorry. The question was, um, what's the fate of comets? What's going to happen to them? Are they just doomed to lose all their material? Um, actually, yes. So if you actually calculate, you look at how much material comes off, and you know, we think about Halley's Comet, you can see there's a certain amount of material comes off, how big it is. You can calculate how many times can it go around before it's used up its stuff. And it's only about 100 orbits. Now, Halley's Comet goes around every uh, 76 years. So that means it's only going to last 7,600 years-ish. So actually, this, this came to, somebody worked this out, OK, and realized that you had to have a place that was like a repository. So you had the, the Kuiper belt, this second um, asteroid belt, was hypothesized by Kuiper, because you know we're really original in our naming. Um, and it was basically, well, the comets have to come from somewhere. We know they can't live for, the, for all their life. So you have all these little chunks of ice and rock. And when Neptune and Uranus happen to go past at the same time, they will have a tug on it, and it will change its orbit. And eventually, it will end up in this elongated orbit. But for most of its life, it's going to live out there in the Kuiper belt. And so it was hypothesized after the discovery of Pluto but before we discovered any other Kuiper Belt objects, which is one of the reasons why Pluto is such a big deal, that it's actually the first Kuiper Belt object we discovered. Other questions? What's the difference between a meteor and a comet? Because I'm just thinking, and if you get to the second part of the question is, what's the chances a meteor will hit the Earth? And the third part of the question, do we ever hope to destroy a meteor before it hit the Earth? OK, those are all good questions. So. Um, so a meteor technically is actually the, um, the trail that a sh of a shooting star. It's, it's basically you have a chunk of rock that comes into the Earth's atmosphere, and you see that trail as it burns up in the atmosphere. Most of them never make it to the ground. So we're actually, the Earth is hit, the Earth is hit nightly by debris. When we have a meteor shower, which happens, and this is something that most people don't realize. You hear about meteor showers, the Leonids, the Geminids, the Perseids, and you can go out and watch lots and lots of shooting stars, right? 
that's actually where we're going through the trail of a comet. So as the comet loses all this material, it keeps going in orbit, right? So you actually have like a snail trail of the dust that was left behind by the comet going around. And as we cross that path, we get that dust hitting the atmosphere. And that is what, we, what is a meteor shower. Most of that material is never going to hit the ground. It's too small. It burns up. Okay? We get hit by meteorites a lot. But most of them we don't notice because they don't cause that much damage. Um, we have you know, some craters that we know about. Meteor crater, they found the, the piece that did it. People go meteorite hunting. Um, but most of them are found either in the desert or in Antarctica, not because they get hit there most, but because they're easier to spot because they don't look like the surrounding stuff. Um, because you're talking about rocks. If a rock landed around here, would you know that it was a, any different than the normal rocks? So, you know, that, that's one of the, the issues. Now, in terms of being hit by something catastrophic, um, inevitably, yes. We, you know, basically, you think about, we're, we're pretty sure now that that's what killed the dinosaurs, right? We've got these events that we know happen. Um, in fact, they managed to figure out if there's an asteroid that's basically like a collection of rubble that ejected a piece, and that's the one that killed the dinosaurs, okay? Um, eventually, the Earth will be hit again by something catastrophic. Whether we can do something about it is a good question. We certainly wouldn't be able to do, um, it wouldn't help to drill down 800 feet and stick in a nuclear weapon and kill Bruce Willis in the process. Um, because what all you do then is think about it. It's moving in this path towards us. Now all you've done is to spread that debris out. So you'll have lots and lots of slightly smaller pieces instead of one big piece. Um, so actually what you need to do is spot it early enough on, and so this is why near-Earth objects is a big part of what NASA uh, does is looking for some of these things, is to spot them and then be able to tweak their orbit just enough. All you need them to do is not hit, and if you, you, could do a, you only need to change orbit a very small amount for that to happen. And so um, there's a lot of ideas about uh, gravity tractors, so if you can take something really massive and put it in the right place, you can pull this thing away. Um, like I said, light can push things. If you can paint one side, you can actually get it pushed how you want it to be pushed. So there are ways we can do it. None of them have been tested. Does the tail size change as a function of the orbit? Does it change throughout the lifetime of the orbit? Okay, so I think everybody heard that question. Um, yes, so basically, as you, you know, when you're out of the Kuiper belt, you have no tail. You're still completely frozen. And as you move in, you're producing more and more gas and the flux of light. So if you think about as you approach a light, it's getting brighter and brighter. Well, that means you've got more and more push. So not only are you losing more material because you're hotter, but you're pushing it more. So as you get closer in, you get to having a really huge tail, and then it comes around, and as it moves back out, it goes down. How it changes with time, I don't think we've seen enough repeaters to be able to say for sure. The question was, can they re be really, really tiny? Um, this is actually what's, what, what happens, is you end up with something that, as it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, eventually it's just going to be so small. But once it's that small, we wouldn't see it. Because, you know, you think about um, when we want, we want to look at something, there's loads and loads of satellites up in, in space that we don't see because they're not big enough to reflect enough light, right? But the moon is really big, even though it's further away, we can see it. At that size, it'd have to basically be hitting us for us to notice. So it would be that big, but we wouldn't see it. Comet. Mm -hmm. So could you elaborate on that? How likely do you think that fruit is hit? So I am, okay. That has been the most popular um, way to get water onto Earth for quite a long time. I think that that is going out of favor right now, uh, and I'll explain what the new hypothesis is. But for the longest time, people couldn't understand how shape, right? And it's, it's, it's going to rotate. And it actually rotates pretty fast. But actually, its rotation is not a nice, simple rotation like that. It's a, I'm not sure what it is that you want to know about. But basically, they're going to be rotating like this. And so what you get is that um, it's going to have daylight 
and nighttime, just like we do, as it spins around. But that's going to happen on a really short time scale. It's only 10 kilometers across, and it's going to be spinning pretty fast. So you're going to get all sorts of weird interactions. But it's possible that you also get, I mean, you've got this thing that it's made of ice and dirt. You could have things where the ice underneath is getting evaporated before the rock on top, and it will explode out. And that could affect how it spins, because you'll get basically like a jet. And it's small enough that that could have an effect. Uh, the question was, how far out do they go? Um, OK, so for the comets that come from the Kuiper Belt, the Kuiper Belt basically extends from um, basically where Neptune is. So that's uh, 30 times the distance of the Earth to the Sun. That's where Neptune is. And then it goes out to about 100 times that. But there are also comets that have much longer periods that come from another part of the solar system called the Oort cloud. And that's out at more like 10,000 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Are Oort clouds a common feature of stars? Or is it thought that they are? OK, so the question is, are Oort clouds a comet feature of stars? Common. Common feature. OK. Um, so the problem, they ought to be if we understand the formation of stars. But they're very hard to detect. Again, we come back to, if you've got something that's very small, we have never detected the old cloud. They're very, very small chunks. They're a really long way away. You've got this light that has to get from the sun all the way out to this distance and all the way back to us, by which time it's too faint. And can you imagine trying to do that for a system that's around another star? So you know, it's a hypothetical construct to explain some of the observations we have. but. We have one object that we've seen that we think is a bona fide um, or cloud object called Sedna. But I don't know. They should be. Is it possible we can change the comet's orbit by sending something that's similar in size to the comet, like connected? That's the idea of the gravity tractor. So yeah, that, that's that you want to put something up next to it, and you can kind of drag it away. But what you do is, if you've got something that's powered and massive, you can then kind of help it just nudge it along. But that's, that's something that's hard to do. So you need to do it far enough out that you don't need to change the orbit too much. right? You just want to be able to tweak it enough so it just goes past us. But yeah, that's one of the methods that is um, currently being investigated. Okay, so there was a really nice graphic that I'll try to describe. Uh, somebody put um, basically this comet as we know it um, and its color based on what the information we've got from Rosetta so far down next to Manhattan. And it would be, in terms of girth, about half the size of Manhattan, but that much upwards too. And it's almost black. Its albedo is very low. It's almost black. So it's very dirty. Right. Would it take a dump truck or a oh, I see. OK. Well, I mean, you know, if you think about it as being something that's 10 kilometers across and made of ice, there's a certain amount of mass. You're going to need to have a significant fraction of that mass if you want to pull it. So yeah, we're talking, well, the idea is not necessarily that you need something um, very large in volume, but that you come up with something very dense that will allow you to pull it that way. Are there any geologic processes on comets that are connected to Earth's orbital? Um, well, that's a good question. That's something that we will find out in a couple of months. So actually, one of the, thing, one of the reasons that comets, like the Stardust mission that ha went through the tail, one of the things that is fascinating about comets is that they're supposed to have formed at the edge of the solar system. It's this material that might never have been modified by geologic processes because it's so cold. And so it might be pristine. It might be something that really is from the beginning of the solar system, which is hard to find. We can find some pieces of meteorites, but it's hard to find that. And so that's actually part of the reason that they're so fascinating, is to try and find out whether we really have this pristine material and what does it look like. So we don't think so, but 
when Stardust came back and we got those particles out, nearly all of them showed that they did not they did not have grains that showed isotopes that suggested they came from outside the solar system. In fact, the first one was discovered last month. They'd been analyzing this stuff for 10 years. And the first, th the first one that showed any evidence of being formed outside the solar system was discovered last month. Okay, so the question was, um, how many comets do we know about, and what's the longest duration? Well, so ignoring the Oort cloud, because they're things that basically don't come back, um, the things that are on orbit, we know of, we know of about 1,000 or 2,000 objects that could become comets out in, in the Kuiper Belt. So it's hard to quantify that. It's like I said, you can have something that's currently in a circular orbit that will become a comet. Um, and the longest duration, well, you know, basically you have to, it, it's not going to be more than a few hundred years. Um, so you've got, you've got uh, Pluto is 250 years, but that's not elongated enough. Once you elongate it, it takes less time. And so, you know, you're talking about, even from the outer edge, maybe two or 300 years. Any other questions? Yeah. You said that uh, meteor showers were generated from the leftovers of comets. For example, what's, where's the first set of that? How does that, where is that generated? Okay, so the, the question was about where the trail is. Uh, I'd have to look up exactly which comet, but we know which comets are which trails. Um, and the reason that it's the Perseids is that as the comet come, uh, as the comet came past as we crossed that trail, it's coming from the, it looks like it's coming from the constellation Perseids. But there will be a specific comet that that's the path that we're crossing. And the same is true. Sorry? It's not visible. The trail? No, the comet. No, now, no. There was another one. Um, well, I mean, this is the first time we tried to land on one. So um, for Deep Impact and um, Stardust, both of which, you know, rendezvoused, let's put it that way, even if they didn't land on it. Um, you're still talking about time from launch to interception in the five to ten year range. What kind of instruments do they use? Well, again, it, it depends. Right, it, it depends. So for Stardust, what they actually had, I don't know if you've ever come across the um, material aerogel, but it's basically made of the same stuff as quartz, but it's like a really, really, it's like a foam that's made from quartz, and that was what was used to trap it. So as things went through, they would, and the trail that they left into it also told you how fast it was moving, so you could get all sorts of information from that. And that was all that one was meant to do, was to collect this. Most of them have cameras on, so if you think about um, the Galileo probe, which was actually going to investigate Jupiter, but got to see a comet hit Jupiter. Um, but it had a camera on board that it turned around and looked, and there's a great image of both a half Earth and a half Moon as it's looking back. And so there's always cameras on these things just to take pretty pictures because, you know, people like pretty pictures. Um, but it depends on what the mission is to do. So for, for, the, for this one and for Deep Impact, they have an orbiter and a lander, or crasher, I guess. Um, I was amused today. I was reading something about it, and it's, it described the, uh, the Rosetta mission as the first soft landing. <laughs> OK. Um, so, you know, you've got, you'll always have um, some sort of camera and probably some sort of spectrometer so that you can determine what things are made of, but otherwise it depends on what your mission is. Earlier you said that um, ice exerts pressure. How does it exert pressure and what is the best shape with my tinfoil hat to deflect that pressure? <laughs> Did everybody hear that? So the question is that um, how does light exert pressure and how, what is the best shape of tinfoil hat to prevent that pressure? Um, so 
Um, so actually, you have to think about it in terms of, most people think of light. Actually, most people don't think of light. So um, it's just there. But light can be considered to be either a wave or a particle. And so light comes in these little packets. And when it's in a packet, even though it has no mass, it has momentum. So as it hits another particle and is absorbed, that momentum goes with the particle that absorbs it. And so for me, I'm, I'm, being, I'm absorbing the momentum of the light that's hitting me. But because I'm so massive, it doesn't make, you know, the force is, is so small, I don't, the effect is negligible. But if you're very low in mass, that can push you. So um, for a particle around in, in the solar system, if it's, you know, something like ice, it can be as big as uh, a micron or five, 10 microns in size, and it will be pushed very, it will be pushed hard enough to get out of the solar system. Um, in terms of the tinfoil hat, any shape will do, as long as it reflects. Any other questions? Has it ever been observed for a comet orbit to be changed? Like maybe like another planet? Um, the question was, has it ever been observed for a comet to, uh, comet's orbit to be changed? Actually, that's what happened with uh, comet Shoemaker-Levy. So this was this comet that um, it got deflected by the outer planets and then ended up plowing into Jupiter. And so it would have gone around a few times and then um, you know, its, its orbit was deflected enough that it hit Jupiter. Have I exhausted you all? All right, well, I would like to encourage you to give Doug respect and... Thank you. Is that yours? Is that yours? Yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you for coming.